It must have been some imp of the perverse, or some sardonic pull from dark hidden sources, which made me change my plans as I did. I had long before resolved to limit my observations to architecture alone, and I was even then hurrying towards the square in an effort to get quick transportation out of this festering city of death and decay. But the sight of old Zadok Allen set up new currents in my mind, and made me slacken my pace uncertainly. I had been assured that the old man could do nothing but hint at wild, disjointed, and incredible legends, and I had been warned that the natives made it unsafe to be seen talking with him. Yet the thought of this aged witness to the town's decay, with memories going back to the early days of ships and factories, was a lure that no amount of reason could make me resist. After all, the strangest and maddest of myths are often merely symbols or allegories based upon truth, and old Zadok must have seen everything which went on around Innsmouth for the last ninety years. Curiosity flared up beyond sense and re- and caution, and in my youthful egotism I fancied I might be able to sift a nucleus of real history from the confused, extravagant I would probably extract with the aid of raw whiskey. I knew that I could not accost him then and there, for the fireman would surely notice and object. Instead, I reckoned, I would prepare by getting some bootleg liquor at a place where the grocery boy had told me it was plentiful. Then I would loaf near the fire station in, appa in apparent casualness, and fall in with old Zadok after he had started on one of his frequent rambles. The youth had said that he was very restless, seldom sitting around the station for more than an hour or two at a time. A quart bottle of whiskey was easily, though not cheaply, obtained in the rear of a dingy variety store just off the square in Elliott Street. The dirty-looking fellow who waited on me had a touch of the staring Innsmouth look, but was quite civil in his way, being perhaps used to the custom of such convivial strangers, truckmen, gold buyers, and the like, as were occasionally in town. Re-entering the square, I saw that luck was with me, for shuffling out of Payne Street around the corner of the Gilman House, I glimpsed nothing less than the tall, lean, tattered form of old Zadok Allen himself, in accordance with my plan, I attracted his attention by brandishing my newly purchased bottle, and soon realised that he had begun to shuffle wistfully after me as I turned into Waite Street on my way to the most deserted region I could think of. I was steering my course by the map the grocery boy had prepared, and was aiming for the wholly abandoned stretch of southern waterfront which I had previously visited. The people in sight there had been the fishermen on the distant breakwater, and by going a few squares south I could get beyond the range of these, finding a pair of seats on some abandoned wharf and being free to question old Zadok unobserved for an indefinite time. Before I reached Main Street I could hear a faint and wheezy, hey, mister, behind me, and I presently allowed the old man to catch up and take copious pulls from the quart bottle. I began putting out feelers as we walked amidst the omnipresent desolation and crazily tilted ruins, but found that the aged tongue did not loosen as quickly as I had expected. At length I saw a grass-grown opening towards the sea between crumbling brick walls, with the weedy length of an earth and masonry wharf bringing beyond. Piles of moss-covered stones near the water promised tolerable seats, and the scene was sheltered from all possible view by a ruined warehouse on the north. Here, I thought, was the ideal place for a long secret colloquy, so I guided my companion down the lane and picked out spots to sit in amongst the mossy stones. The air of death and, and desertion was ghoulish, and the smell of fish almost insufferable, but I was resolved to let nothing deter me. About four hours remained for conversation, if I were to catch the eight o'clock coach for Arkham, and I began to dole out more liquor to the ancient tippler, meanwhile eating my own frugal lunch. 
In my donations, I was careful not to overshoot the mark, for I did not wish Zadok's vi vinous garrulousness to pass into a stupor. After an hour, his furtive tac taciturnity showed signs of disappearing, but much to my disappointment, he still sidetracked my questions about Innsmouth and its shadow-haunted past. He would babble of current topics, revealing a wide acquaintance with newspapers and a great tendency to philosophize in sententious village fashion. Toward the end of the second hour, I feared my quart of whiskey would not be enough to produce results, and was wondering whether I had better leave old Zadok and go back for more. Just then, however, chance made the opening which my questions had been unable to make, and the wheezing ancient's rambling took a turn that caused me to lean forward and listen alertly. My back was towards the fishy-smelling sea, but he was facing it, and something or other had caused his wandering gaze to light on the low, distant line of Devil Reef, then showing plainly and almost fascinatingly above the waves. The sight seemed to displease him, for he began a series of weak curses which ended in a confidential whisper and a knowing leer. He bent towards me, took hold of my coat lapel, and hissed out some hints that could not be mistaken. Thar is where it all began, that cursed place of all wickedness where the deep water starts. Gay to hell, sheer drop down to a bottom no sound and line can tetch. Old Captain Obed done it, him that found out morn was good for him in the South Sea Islands. Everybody was in a bad way them days. Trade fallin' off, mills losing business, even the new ones, and the best of our men folks kit a privateerin' in the War of 1812 are lost with the Elysee Brig and the Ranger Scow, both on em Gilman Venters. Obed Marsh, he had three ships afloat, Brigantine Columby, Brig Hefty, and Bark Sumatri Queen. He was the only one as kept on with the East Inji and Pacific trade, though Esdras Martin's Barkentine Malay Bride made a venter as late as twenty-eight. Never was nobody like Captain Obed, old limb of Satan. I can mind him to tellin' about furrin parts and callin' all the folks stupid for goin' to a Christian meetin' and bearin' their burdens meek and lowly. Says they ought to get better gods like some of the folks in the Injies. Gods as bring em good fishin' in return for their sacrifices, and it really answer folks's prayers. Matt Elliot, his first walked a lot too, only he was against folks doing any heathen things. Talk about an island east of Oathhate, where they's doing a lot of stone ruins older than anybody knew anything about. Kinda like them on Ponope in the Carolines, but with caverns of faces that looked like the big statues on Easter Island. Thar was a little volcanic island near thar too, where there was other ruins with different carvin. Ruins all wore away like they'd been under the sea, onked off with pictures of awful monsters all over them. Well, sir, Matt says the natives around there had all the fish they could catch, and sported bracelets and armlets and head rigs made out of a queer kind of gold and covered with pictures of monsters, just like the ones carved on ruins on the little island, sort of fish-like frogs or frog-like fishes that was drawed in all kinds of positions like they was human beings. Nobody could get out of them. No, what nobody could get out of them what they were got with all the stuff, and all the other natives wondered how they managed to fish in plenty even when the very next island had lean pickings. Matt, he got to wandering too, and so did Captain Obed. Obed, he notices besides that lots of the handsome young folks had drop out of sight for good from year to year, and that they want many old folks around. Also, he thinks some of the folks looked in queer, even for Kanakis. It took Obed to get the truth about them heathen. I don't know how he done it, but he began by trading for the gold-like things they wore, asked them where they come from and if they could get more, and finally, 
wormed the story out of the old chief. Wallachia, they called him. Nobody but Obed had ever believed the old yeller devil, but the captain could read folks like they was books. Heh, <laughs> heh. Nobody never believes me now when I tell em, and I don't suppose you will, young feller, though, come to look at ye, ye have kind of got them sharp reading eyes like Obed had. The man's whisper grew fainter, and I found myself shuddering at the terrible and sincere portentousness of his intonation, even though I knew his tale could be nothing but drunken fantasy. Well, Sir Obed, he learnt that these things on the earth as most folks never heard about, and wouldn't believe if they did hear. It seems these Kanakis was sacrificing heaps of their young men and maidens to some kind of god things that lived under the sea, and getting all kinds of favor in return. They met the things on the little islet with the queer ruins, and it seems them awful pictures of frogfish monsters was supposed to be pictures of these things. Maybe they was the kind of as has got all the mermaid stories and such started. They had all kinds of cities on the sea bottom, and this island was heaved up from thar. Seems they was some of the things alive in the stone buildings when the island come up sudden to the surface. That's how the Kanakis got wind they was down thar. Made sign talk as soon as they got over being scared and picked up bargain afore long. Them things liked human sacrifices. Had em ages afore, but lost track of the upper world after a time. What they done to the victims, it ain't for me to say, and I guess Obed wasn't, no, wasn't none too sharp about asking. But it was all right with the heathens, because they been having a hard time and was desperate about everything. They gave a certain number of young folks to the sea things twice every year, may even Halloween, regular as could be. Also give some of the carved knickknacks they made. What the things agreed to give in return was plenty of fish. They drove them up from all over the sea, and a few gold things now and then. Well, as I says, the natives met the things on the little volcanic islet, going thar in canoes with sacrifices, etc., and bringing back any of the gold-like jewels as was coming to them. At first, the things didn't never go on to the main island, but arter a time, they come to want to. Seems they hankered arter mixing with the folks and having joint ceremonies on the big days, May Eve and Halloween. You see, they was able to live both in ant and out of water, what they call amphibians, I guess. The Kanakis told them as how folks from other islands want to wipe them out if they got wind of their being there, but they says they don't care much because they could wipe out the whole brood of humans if they was willing to bother. That is, any as didn't be certain signs such as was used onto the lost old ones, whether they was. But not wanting to bother, they lay low when anybody visited the island. When it come to mating with them toad-looking fishes, the Kanakis kind of balked, but finally they learnt something as put a new face on the matter. Seems that human folks has got a kind of relation to such water beasts, that everything alive come about out of the water, often only needs a little change to go back again. Them things told the Kanakis that if they mixed bloods, There'd be children as it'd look human at first, but later turn more and more like the things, till finally they'd take to the water and join the main lot of things down her. And this is the important part, young feller. Them as turned into fish things and went into the water wouldn't never die. Them things never died except they was killed violent. Well, sir, it seems by the time Obed knowed them islanders, they was all full of fish blood from them deep water things. When they got old and began to show it, they kept hid till they felt like taking to the water and quitting the place. Some was more teched than others, and some never did change quite enough to take to the water, but mostly they turned out just the way them things said. Them as was born 
like that things changed early, but them that was nearly human sometimes stayed on the island till they was past seventy, though they'd usually go down on the, for the trials trips before that. Folks as had took to the water generally come back a good deal to visit, so a man would often be a talkin' to his own five times great grandfather who'd left the dry land a couple of hundred years or so afore. Everybody got about the idea of dying, except in canoe wars and with other islanders, or as sacrifices to the sea gods down below, or from snake bite or plague or sharp galloping ailments or something afore they could take to the water, but simply looked forward to a kind of change that one a bit horrible arted a while. They thought what they'd got was well with what they'd have to give up, and I guess Obed kind of came th- thought of himself when he chewed over old Wallach's story a bit. Wallachia, though, was one of the few as hadn't got none of the fish blood, being of a royal line that intermarried with royal lines on other islands. Wallachia, he showed Abed a lot of rites and incantations as had to do with the sea things, and let him see some of the folk villages had changed a lot from human shape. Somehow or other, though, he never would let them see one of the regular things from right out of the water. In the end, he gave him a funny kind of thingamajig made out of lead or something that he said it'd bring up the fish things from any place in the water where they might be a nest of them. The idea was to drop it down with the right kind of prayers and such, while a key are allowed as the things were scattered all over the world, so anybody that looked about could find a nest and bring them up if they was wanted. Matt, he didn't like this business at all, and he wanted Obed shut keep away from the island, but the captain was sharp for gain, and found he could get them gold-like things so cheap it'd pay him to make a specialty of them. Things went that way for years, and Obed got enough of the gold-like stuff to make him start the refinery and wait so he'll run down full and mill. He didn't just sell the pieces like they was, for folks would be all the time asking questions. All the same, his crews would get a piece and dispose it now and then, even though they was swore to keep quiet, and he let his women folks wear some of the pieces This was more human-like than Well, come about 38, which when I was seven year old, Obed, he found the island people all wiped out between voyages. Seems the other islanders got wind of what was going on and had took matters into their own hands. Suppose they must have had, after all, them old magic signs as the sea thing says was the only things they was afeard of. No telling what any of them Kanakis will chance to get a hold of when the sea bottom throws up some islands with ruins older than the deluge. Pious cusses these was. They didn't leave nothing standing on either the main island or the little volcanic islet, except what parts of the ruins was too big to knock down. In some places they was little stones strewed about, like charms, with something on them like what ye might call a swastika nowadays. Probably them was the old one's signs. Folks all riped out about no trace of no gold-like things, and none the nearby Kanakis would breathe a word about the matter. Wouldn't even admit they'd ever been people on that island. That naturally hit Obed pretty hard, seeing as his normal trade was doing very poor. It hit the whole of Innsmouth, too, because in the seafarant days, what profited the master of the ship generally profited the crew proportionate. Most of the folks around the town took the hard times kind of sheep-like and resigned, but they was in bad shape because the fishing was petering out and the mills weren't doing no well. When the times Obed, he began a cursing at the folks for being dull sheep and praying to a Christian heaven as didn't help em none. I uh, told him he had a note of folks who prayed to gods that give him something he really need and says if a good bunch of men would stand by him, he could maybe get a hold to certain powers as it'd bring plenty of fish and quite a good bit of gold. Of course, them as served in the Samartri Queen and seed the island knowed what he meant, 
and weren't none too anxious to get close to see things like they heard tell on, but them as didn't know what was all about got kind of swayed by what Obed had to say, and begun to ask him what he could do to sit him on the way to the faith as it bring him results. Here the old man fault. Here the old man faltered, mumbled, and lapsed into a moody and apprehensive silence, glancing nervously over his shoulder and then turning back to stare fascinatedly at the distant black reef. When I spoke to him, he did not answer, so I knew I would have to let him finish the bottle. The insane yarn I was hearing interested me profoundly, for I fancied there was contained within it a sort of crude allegory, based upon the strangeness of Innsmouth and elaborated by an imagination at once creative and full of scraps of exotic legend. Not for a moment did I believe that the tale had any really substantial foundation, but nonetheless the account held a, a hint of genuine terror, if only because it brought in references to strange jewels clearly akin to the malign tiara I had seen in port. Perhaps the ornaments had, after all, come from some strange island, and possibly the wild stories were lies of bygone Obed himself rather than of this antique toper. I handed Zadok the bottle, and he drained it to the last drop. I was curious how he could stand so much whiskey, for not even a trace of thickness had come into his high, wheezy voice. He licked the nose of the bottle and slipped it into his pocket, and beginning to nod and whisper softly to himself, I bent close to catch any articulate words he might utter, and thought I saw a sardonic smile behind the stained bushy whiskers. Yes, he was really forming words, and I could grasp a fair proportion of them. Poor Matt. Matt, he's always was against it line up the folks on his side and had long talks with the preachers. No use. They run the congregational parson out of town and the Methodist fella quit. I never did see the resolved Babcock, the Baptist person, again. Wrath of Jehovah. I was a mighty little critter, but I heard what I heard and seen what I've seen. Dagon and Ash to Wrath. Belial, and Beelzebub, Golden Calf, and the idols of Canaan, and the Philistines, Babylonian abominations, Mene, Mene, Tekel, a parson. He stopped again, and from the look in his watery blue eyes, I feared he was close to a stupor after all. But when I gently shook his shoulder, he turned on me with astonishing alertness, and snapped out some more obscure phrases. Done believe me, eh? Eh, eh, then just tell me, young feller, why'd Captain Obed had twenty odd other folks used to row about to Devil Reef in the dead of night and chant things so loud you could hear em all over town when the wind was right? Tell me that, hey, and tell me why Obed was allus dropping heavy things down the deep water to other side of the reef when the bottom shoots down the cliff lower and ye can see around. Tell me what he done with that funny-shaped lead thingamajig as while well a key you give him, hey, boy? And, and what did they howl on May Eve and again the next Halloween? And why'd the new church parsons, fellers as used to be sailors, wear them queer robes and cover theirselves with them gold-like things old bed brung, hey? The watery blue eyes were almost savage and maniacal now, and the dirty white beard bristled electrically. Old Zadok probably saw me shrink back, for he began to cackle evilly. Heh 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 heh, beginning to see, hey? Maybe you'd a been like to have been me in them days when I seed things at night out of sea from the cup of the top of my house. Oh, I can tell ye little pictures have big ears, and I wasn't missing nothing of what was gossiped about Captain Obed and the folks about the reef. Heh heh heh. How about the night I took my pa's ship glass up to the cup below and seed the reef a bristling thick with shapes that dove off quick soon as the moon rise? 
Obed and the folks was in a dory, but them shapes drove off the far side into the deep water and never come up. How'd you like to be a little shaver alone up in a couple of watching shapes as weren't human shapes, ha? 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 The old man was getting hysterical, and I began to shiver with a nameless alarm. He laid a gnarled claw on my shoulder, and it seemed to me that its shaking was not altogether that of mirth. Spose one night you seed something heavy heaved off an Obed's dory beyond the reef, and then learned next day a young feller was missing from home. Hey, did did anybody ever see Hyde or Hare or Hiram Gilman again? Did they? And Nick Pierce and Louie Waite and Adornadam Southwick and Henry Garrison? Hey. Hey, shapes talking sign language with their hands. Them has had real hands. Well, sir, that was the time Obed began to get on his feet again. Folks see these three darters a-wearing gold-like things as nobody never seen on them afore, and smoke started coming out of them refinery chimbley. Other folks was prospering too. Fish began to swarm into the harbor, fit to kill, and heaven knows what sized cargoes we began to ship out about Newburyport, Arkham, and Boston. That was when Obed got the old branch railroad put through. Some Kingsport fishermen heard about the catch and came up in sloops, but they was all lost. Nobody never see em again. And just there now, folks organized the esoteric order of Dagon and brought Masonic Hall off in cavalry command- commandery for it. Heh heh heh. Matt Elliot was a mason and again the selling, but he dropped out of sight just then. You remember, I ain't saying Obed was set on having things just like they was on that Kanaki Isle. I, I don't think he aimed to do first no 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 mixin', nor raise no young'uns to take them to the water and turn into fishers with eternal life. He he wanted them gold things and was willing to pay heavy, and I guess the others was satisfied for a while. Coming forty six, the town done looking like some thinkin' for itself. Too many folks missing. Too much wild preaching at meeting of a Sunday. Too much talk about that reef. I, uh, I guess I done a bit by telling Selectman Mowry what I see from the cup below. Uh, it was a party one night as Fulford Obed's crowd around the reef, and I heard shots betwixt the dories. And the next day, Obed and thirty-two others was in jail with everybody a wandering just what was afoot and. Just what charge him again could have got to halt. God, if anybody had look ahead. A couple of weeks later, when nothing had been thrown into the sea for that long. Zadok was showing signs of fright and exhaustion, and I let him keep silence for a while, though glancing apprehensively at my watch. The tide had turned and was coming in now, and the sight of the waves seemed to arouse him. I was glad of that tide, for at high water the fishy smell might not be so bad. Again, I strained to catch his whispers. That awful night. I seed em. I was up in a couple of hordes of them, swarms of them all over the reef, and swimming up the harbour to the manic set. God, what happened in the streets of Innsmouth that night? They rattled our door, but Pa wouldn't open. Then he clumb out of the kitchen window with his musket to find Selectman Maury and see what he could do. Mounds of the dead and the dying. Shots, screams, shouting in Old Square and Town Square and New Church Green. Jail throwed open. Proclamation, treason, called it the plague when folks come in and found half our people missing. Nobody left as them as jied with Obed, and as them things else keep quiet. I never heard of my pa no more. The old man was panting and perspiring profusely. His grip on my shoulder tightened. Everything cleaned up in the morning. They was traces. Obed, he kinder takes charge and says things is gonna be changed. 
uh, others of worship with us at meeting time in certain houses he's got to entertain guests uh, they wanted to mix like they done with the kanakis and he for one didn't feel bound to stop him uh, far gone was obed just like a crazy man on the subject he said they brung us fish and treasure and should have what they hankered after uh, nothing was to be different on the outside only we was to keep shy of strangers if we knowed what was good for us we all had to take the oath of Dagon, and later they was on second and third oaths that some of us took. They, they has had them done special and get special rewards, gold and such. No use balking, for they was millions of them down there. They'd rather not start rising and wiping out humankind, but if they was gave away and forced to, they could do a lot towards just that. Uh, we didn't have them old charms to cut them off like folks in the South Sea did, and them Kanakis would never give away their secrets. Yield up enough sacrifices and savage knickknacks and harbridge in the town when they wanted it, and they'd let well enough alone, wouldn't bother no strangers as might bear tales outside, that is, without they all prying, all in the band of the faithful order of Dagon, and the children should never die, but go back to Father Hydra and Father Dagon, the what we all came from, La, La, Cthulhu, Dagon, Cthulhu, Mdwaf, Cthulhu, Rilia, Waga, Nagel, Dagon. Old Zadok was fast lapsing into stark raving, and I held my breath. Poor old soul. To what pitiful depths of hallucination had his liquor, plus his hatred of the decay, alienage, and d d disease around him, brought that fertile, imaginative brain. He began to moan now, and tears were coursing down his channeled cheeks into the depths of his beard. God, what I seen since that I was fifteen year old, man a man a tackle a parson. The folks as was missin', and them as killed themselves, them as told things in Arkham or Ipswich or such places was all called crazy like you're calling me right now. But God, what I seen, they had killed me long ago for what I know, only I took the first and second oaths a day go off in our bed so as protected unless a jury of them proved I told things knowing that deliberate. Uh, but I wouldn't take the third oath. I'd have died rather than take that. Uh, it got was around Civil War time when children born sect 46 began to grow up. Some of them, that is. Uh, I was afeard. Never did no praying after that awful night. And never did see one of them close to in all my life. That is, never no full-blooded one. I went to the war. And if I had seen any guts or sense, I'd have never come back, but settled away from here. But uh, folks wrote me things weren't so bad. Uh, that, I, I suppose, was because government draft men was in town after 63. Out of the war, it was just as bad again. People began to fall off. Mills and shops shut down. Shipping stopped and the harbor choked up. Railroad give up, but they... Never stopped swimming in and out of the river from cursed reef of Satan, and more and more arctic winders got aboarded up, and more and more noises was heard in houses as weren't supposed to have nobody in them. Folks outside have their stories about us. Suppose you've heard plenty of them, seeing what questions he asked. Stories about things that see now and then, and about a queer jewelry as comes in from somewhere as ain't, ain't quite melted up, but nothing never gets definite. Nobody will believe nothing. They call them gold things pirate loot, and allow the Innsmouth folks as fern blood, or as distempered, or something. Besides... Them that lives here shoo off as many strangers as they can and encourage the rest not to get very curious, especially around night time. B. 
beasts bark at the critters. Horses, wuss, and mules, but when they got Ardos, that was all right. In 46, Captain Obed took a second wife that nobody in the town never see. Some says he didn't want to, but was made to by them he'd called in. Had three children by her. Two has disappeared young, but one girl has looked like anybody else and was editated in Europe. Obed finally got her married off by a trick to an Arkham feller as didn't suspect nothing, but... Nobody outside will have nothing to do with Innsmouth folks now. Barnabas Marsh that runs the refinery now is Obed's grandson by his first wife, son of Onesiphorus, his oldest son, but his mother was another of them as weren't seen outdoors. Right now, Barnabas is about changed. Can't shut his eyes no more, and is all out of shape. They say he still wears clothes, but he'll take to the water soon. Maybe he's tried it already. They do sometimes go down for little spells afore they go down for good. Ain't been seed about in public for nigh on ten years. Uh, don't know how his poor wife can feel. She came from Ipswich and they nigh lynched Barnabas when he courted her fifty odd years ago. Oh, Betty, he died seventy eight, and all the next generation is gone now. The First wife's children dead, and the rest, God knows. The sound of the incoming tide was now very insistent, and little by little it seemed to change the old man's mood, from maudlin tearfulness to watchful fear. He would pause now and then to renew those nervous glances over his shoulder or out towards the reef, and despite the wild absurdity of his tale, I could not help beginning to share his apprehensiveness. Zadok now grew shriller, seemed to be trying to whip up his courage with louder speech. Hey, you, wh why don't you say something? How'd you like to be living in a town like this, with everything a rotten and dying and boarded up monsters crawling and bleating and barking and hopping around black cellars and attics every way you turn? Hey, how'd you like to hear the howl and night after night from the churches and order a day gone hall and no doing parts of the howling. How'd you like to hear what comes from that awful reef every May Eve and hallow mass, hey? Think the old man's crazy, hey? Well, sir, let me tell you, that ain't the worst. Zadok was really screaming now, and the mad frenzy of his voice disturbed me more than I care to own. Curse ye, don't ye sit there starin' at me with them eyes. I tell Obed Marsh he's in hell, and he's got to stay there. <sighs> in hell, I says, can't get me. I ain't done nothing, nor told nobody nothing. Oh, you young feller, why, well, I haven't half told nobody nothing yet. I'm a-goin' to now. You just sit still and listen to me, boy. This is what I ain't never told nobody. I says I didn't get to do prying after that night, but I found the things about just the same. You all want to know what the real horror is? Hey, well, it's this. It ain't what them fish devils has done, but what they're gone to do. They're bringing things up about where they come from into the town, been doing it for years and slacking them up lately. Them houses north of the river betwixt water and main streets is full of them. Them devils and what they brung and what they get ready. I say, when they get, ever heard of a shoggoth? Here, do you hear me? I tell you, you know what these things be. I seen them one night when... Eh, eh, eh. The hideous suddenness and inhuman frightfulness of the old man's shriek almost made me faint. His eyes, looking past me towards the Maladora Sea, were positively starting from his head, while his face was a mask of fear worthy of Greek tragedy. His bony claw clung deep mo monstrously into my shoulder, and he made no motion as I turned my head to look at whatever he had glimpsed. There was nothing that I could see, only the incoming tide, with perhaps one set of ripples more local than the long-flung line of breakers. 
but now Zadok was shaking me, and I turned back to watch the melting of that fear-frozen face into a chaos of twitching eyelids and mumbling gums. Presently, his voice came back, albeit as a trembling whisper. Get out of here. Get out of here. They seen us. Get out for your life. Don't wait for nothing. They know now. Run for it. Quick, out of this town. Another heavy wave dashed against the loosening masonry of a bygone wharf and changed the mad ancient's whisper to another inhuman and blood-curdling scream. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Before I could recover my scattered wits, he had relaxed his clutch on my shoulder and dashed wildly inland towards the street, reeling northward around the ruined warehouse wall. I glanced back at the sea, but there was nothing there. And when I reached Water Street and looked along it towards the north, there was no remaining trace of Zadok Allen. End chapter 3